fans. You're here as always with a brand new episode of Slasher Studios Horror Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Andrew. Andrew, how are you doing tonight? Hi, I'm good. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad at all. So um, I guess before we kind of dive into the the topic of the week, um, have you watched any new horror movies lately? Well, I finally got to see The Mutilator because I had never, ever seen it. And it was it was good. It was very strange. I mean, it's one of those movies that only could have been made in the eighties. Um, but yeah, no, I I liked it. I'm I'm gonna watch it again to give it a like full assessment. But when I, when I watched it, I was just kind of like, what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, um, I still need to watch it again. Um, I I owned it, or I guess I still do own it. Like, it was, you know, a really bad DVD-R that's like the, it's just a VHS transfer. And it's, I know that I watched it when I first got it, but it was so dark, you could barely see anything. So I'm excited to see it, like, cleaned up. Yeah, no, it looks it looks great. I mean, you can see everything. It's It's a really nice transfer. They did a really good job, so. But yeah, other than nice, that, yeah, I, I mean, haven't really watched. Oops. Other than that, I really haven't watched anything. Um, we're going to see The Witch sometime this weekend. So nice. Well, I well, I've heard really good reviews. So cross fingers. Um, I cross fingers more that you're going to have a good audience. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm hoping, like, I think if we do go, it's going to be, like, a, a noon show on, like, Sunday. Yeah, I've kind of learned that for horror movies, um, the earlier you can see it, the better, and probably, yeah, Sunday is probably going to be your best bet. But, I mean, it will be a lot more difficult because... Um, what is the word I'm thinking of? It's uh it's an R rating. So it'll be less like teeny bopper than like when we went and saw although I was worried when we saw the boy because it was like raining out and the theater was really busy and it was T G thirteen. But you know, everybody kinda kept their mouth shut, so that was nice. So let's let's hope I have the same kind of luck. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you really never know kind of what you're going to get with the whole theater experience. Um, I guess I haven't watched anything at the theater for a few weeks, but um, I was getting caught up on all the Oscar movies. And, I mean, granted, if you're if you're asking for a good crowd, like the Oscar movies are, like, perfect to see at the theater because it's all, like, I know, I know we recently saw Spotlight, which was excellent. I highly recommend it. Check it out. But, um... Like, I would say that, like, the youngest person in the theater besides us was still probably double our age. <laughs> yeah, I, there's there's been times I've gone to see movies and I'm the, the youngest person there, and I prefer it um, until, like, we had a problem with, uh, we had a problem at uh, Star Wars, they fall asleep. <laughs> and they oh, start snoring? snoring very, very loud. Yes. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> oh, God. Like, um, full on, I forgot like... what movie it was. <laughs> I forgot what movie it was, but, like, for whatever... I God, I wish I could remember what movie it was, but there was, like, this group of little old ladies. There was probably, like, ten of them, and they 
I don't know, all excited to see a movie for a matinee, like, I guess it was just like a friendly treat or whatever, but one of their cell phones was ringing, and it kept ringing and ringing and ringing, and then she's like, oh, which she just yells out, she's like, oh, that's mine, and then she, like, looks back to us, and she's like, I'm sorry, I thought it was on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, see, it's moments like that where you're just kind of like, oh, <laughs> you can't get mad at him for yeah, that. Yeah, moments like that that I could be like, oh, like, I'm fine. And she even apologized afterwards. I'm like, no, like, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you can't get mad at that because, you know, she's adorably old. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's really cute. I know that when we went to see, I think it was Brooklyn, um, like there was this thing at the beginning that was like, oh, like make sure to follow us on Twitter, and like the the old man was with like the his wife, and like what's Twitter? And she's like, just watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, old people. Yeah, so it's so things like that that I don't really mind at all. Um, I actually did see a new horror movie, kind of new-ish. I rented it from Breadbox, and it was delightfully, deliciously awful. Um, I believe it was a Lifetime movie, and it was changed for the DVD release. It was originally called um, High School Possession, and now it's High School Exorcism. And, oh, my God, this is... If you guys can rent this, it's it's not worth more than a dollar. Don't pay more than the dollar to watch it, but... Oh, it's delightfully trashy. It's like, um, like I don't even know how to really describe it. And I can't even remember the actress, but the, the main girl from Detention, um, she's kind of like this this church girl, and there's this bad girl, and then all of a sudden this stuff starts happening, and it's very strange. It's kind of like... It's kind of like stigmata meets scream, where there's like this third act twist, where it's like, oh, like someone's in on it, and it's, I don't know, it's if if you like kind of trashy melodramatic horror, this is kind of the movie for you. <laughs> I think I'll skip it. <laughs> I saw the I saw the cover of it um, at Best Buy, and I was like, eh, I don't know. Although, did, did you know that there's a TV show on Chiller called Slasher that's premiering soon? You know, I saw somebody post about it, but I didn't watch, like, the trailer or anything for it. Like, I just assumed that it was a new a new movie coming out, but no, that's awesome. I, I know nothing about it. Yes, yeah, same. And I'm kind of excited about that. And then... uh. Let's see, uh, Scream Season 2 starts in April. So, bring her on. Let's get some more TV horror. Now, with um, Scream Season 2, is that going to be, I mean, is it a whole new cast? Is it carry over from the original, or how are they doing that? It's um, carried over. It's their senior year. Um. Because from what I remember, I read an article where they said uh, season one was like the beginning of their senior year that ends in um, Halloween, and season two will be like around graduation and prom and stuff. So, interesting. Hopefully, I know I'm going to grill the cast at Whorehound about, you know, what's going to happen. What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, what's going to happen? That's one, those, that's one of those shows where, like, I hope that they kind of learn from the mistakes that they made from the first season, um, because there were definitely some good elements to it. Um, there was a lot of not so great ones, but I feel like if they like listen to kind of the fan reaction and try to kind of gauge from that, um, yeah, I'd be curious to see where it's going to go in the second season. Yeah, I mean, the thing that is is. What I kind of got from most people saying that um, a big thing was it was bloodless. I mean, we just had we had too many issues or issues. 
um, too many ep- uh, episodes without someone dying. And even the finale, it was like one or two people that I hope they just kind of realized to amp it up a little bit more. I mean, it's kind of like American Horror Story. Let's put the horror back in American Horror Story. Yeah, I think that, you know, especially with shows that, you know, you know, not every show is going to be, you know, a Netflix marathon. And I think that we've kind of gotten to where we are as a culture where we kind of forget that, hey, people still watch shows week to week. And when you're kind of binge watching a TV show, when it's kind of like a bad or a mediocre episode, it doesn't matter so much because, I mean, I know when I binge watch TV shows, you can ask me like an hour later and I'll be like, I think that one happened in this episode where it just all becomes a mush, for better or worse. Um, So you're kind of able to forgive that more than kind of the appointment television. So... Yeah, I think that they that's something to really focus on. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I hope they, they have new showrunners. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I mean, I like the first season. It wasn't perfect by any means, but I, I see people that say it's the worst thing over and over again. And I'm just kind of like, really? Have we watched the same shows? Because I can name you some of the worst. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things, too. I mean, we talked about it before where, you know, everything becomes either the worst or the best or it be, you know, people will be talking about, oh, like, this is the best thing I've seen in a while. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, it's overrated. And it's just, ugh. Like, just take it for what it's worth. No show's going to be perfect. No show's going to be worthless. Like, if you like it, keep watching it. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Like, it's really as easy as that. Oh, I know. I just, Yeah. I think it's hysterical. I'm waiting for all the 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 witch is so overrated posts because you know it's going to come sooner or later. Yeah, I mean, I I saw that trailer and I'm like, yeah, like you just know that's going to be a movie that audiences are not going to like. Like it's it's going to be a slow burn and there's probably not going to be a lot of stuff happening probably for the first hour of the movie. And granted, I have not seen it. I know nothing about it, just basing it on the trailer. But it's really weird because the stuff that seems to bring in people, they seem to not like it for exactly the reason that it brought the people in for to see it. Like, I never understood that. Um, I think that a good example of that kind of phenomenon is Unfriended, where it's like, oh, this whole movie is on my computer. I'm like, well, yeah, did you watch the trailer? Like, it's not like they were advertising it as something that it wasn't. Like, I've, I've never understood that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in this day and age, people are just so finicky. I mean, there was that lady that sued the film studio because the trailer for Drive made it look like a high-octane Fast and Furious. And she did not want a, a drama and I'm just kind of like okay <laughs> um can can you sue for that because I I can name about 30 movies that I got duped <laughs> by a good trailer you know, I mean, not only that but we live in the age of the internet like you could probably read one review that's going to tell you that maybe the trailer is not the movie that it, you know, that it really is. Like, it's not that hard to find out information. It's kind of like all those parents that were, like, outraged by, like, um, by all, like, the violence and uh, the language in Deadpool. And it's like, well, did you watch the trailer? Like, they've been advertising this as kind of the vulgar superhero movie of the decade. Like, it's delivering exactly what it says it's going to. And if you're stupid enough to bring your kid into the theater to see it, you know, that's good. Oh, I know. I, know. I, I, I love the, the thing I read on Facebook where they're like, I wish there was something that would have told us it was going to be that kind of movie. And somebody's like, you mean like the R rating? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's so silly. Like, I just, you know... You know, I don't really have any desire to see Deadpool. I probably won't like it. Like, and I, I know that. 
But, like, I wouldn't go into the movie expecting that it's something that it's not because I think that people are going to love it for the reasons that it's advertising. And that's that. It's raunchy and filthy and very, very, very R-rated. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I kind of – I remember reading about it um, with the R-rating, and it basically was just like we just can't wait for all the people who think, Oh well, even though it's an R rating, it won't be as bad as they think it is, and it is. So, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's silly and it's dumb and it's uh, I don't know, like it's it's just really awful. Like, but um, speaking of very R rated and kind of vulgar and stuff like that, this week we're going to be talking about kind of smutty, sleazy slashers. Now. The movies that we're going to be talking about on this show, like, and I don't know which ones Andrew want to talk about. Um, I have a list, too. But they're not going to be so much that, like, and I don't really have a better word for it than the icky-feeling slashers, which, if you guys are listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, it's stuff like, um, I guess, you know, they're borderline slashers, but stuff like, I spent in your grave and last house on left. Like that's, I mean, those are technically smutty and sleazy movies. We're not going to be talking about those. We're going to be talking about more of the fun ones that don't take themselves so seriously, that are deliberately over the top, whether it be, you know, violence or nudity, or just kind of amped up to the next level where it's impossible to really kind of take fault at the sleaziness here because, it's done for a deliberate reason. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're going to be talking about a lot of our favorites. Um, Andrew, would you like to kind of start us off with one of yours? Well, I mean, this is hard because there's so many that can kind of, like, fit under this banner. But, I mean, one that I, I recently rewatched with a Blu-ray release was uh, Strip to Kill, and it's still just as good as it was back then. That's one of those where it's like, it's a sleazy slasher, but there's a lot more to it. And I feel like it's, it's like Slumber Party Massacre where people get hear the title and write it off immediately. Whereas I, there's a lot, there's a lot more to this movie than, you know, just, I mean, if you want just a, a cheesy stripper murder movie, then go with the sequel, which is also amazing, and that's also on my list. But the first one's actually really, really, really good. Yeah, um, low budget, I, actually of just, <laughs> I actually just recently got the um, the original when it was released in DVD, and yeah, I was surprised at how how well made it was. Like it was serious, but it was serious in a tone that you you could tell that they took the material seriously, but they weren't necessarily taking themselves seriously. And that's, that's a very fine line. It's, you know, it's, it's very easy to kind of jump over that line and try to, you know, be above the material, which when it comes to slashers or horror movies in general, that's like the worst thing that you can do. If you think that you're above this material, the movie's just doomed to fail. And these kind of movies work because I don't want to say necessarily that they're in on the joke, but they know exactly the movies that they're delivering. To make it a good film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really kind of the um, important thing there, too, is that, you know, I know some of the movies on my list, like, they're, they're very varying in quality, some of them are much better than others, but they all tried to be a good movie, whether, you know, it was just to have fun or they tried to deliver, like, a serious topic. Um, they, they all gave it their best effort. And, yeah, um, Strip to Kill, I still need to see the sequel. I just recently bought it, but oh, I haven't so watched bad. it yet. And, uh, oh, my God, I watch really, it today. <laughs> I might have to because, yeah, it's, I, I, I could use kind of a, a you know, Kind of, you know, I don't have to think about this movie. <laughs> kind of, and you, know, you don't. But it's so good. 
Nice, yeah. Um, yeah, I will definitely have to check that out. Um, so, yeah, some recommendations for you. Um, I'm going to jump right in with a movie that I just recently saw, not last night, but the night before, and that's Out of the Dark. And Out of the Dark is you got this clown killer named Bobo, and he's killing these phone sex workers, and it's so, so much fun. You have... Karen Black as kind of the 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 manager of the phone sex girls who's just like, you know, screaming over the top like, you stay away from my girls. And you got Divine as a police detective and you got, I mean, it's just, this movie is just so crazy. And it's, I wouldn't say it's very good, but it follows all, I, at least on my list, like there's, there's kind of like this checkpoint of kind of slashers from the late 80s and early 90s where, you know, you have like the jazz soundtrack and you have like the the, the fashions with like the big hair and just kind of like the low-key lighting and kind of the haziness. And, you know, pretty much all of these movies really kind of fall under all of that and just kind of watching them after the fact just make them so much more fun because it's just like, oh, wow, like, what were they on when they made this? Like, it's just, it's crazy, but it's crazy in a good way. Cocaine, usually. Lots of it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that was actually one that I thought of right away, too. Um, I, Divine's in it, but I I just know that there's, like, a trio of, like, late 80s, like, horror film actresses, like, uh, Star and Dreef and uh, Karen Witter, who was the deliciously bitchy joy in popcorn. And then, of course, Karen Mayo Chandler, rest in peace, from 976 Evil 2, Hard to Die. She's also in uh, Strip to Kill 2. Like, she was in a bunch of those movies. I liked it. (laughs) Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where, you know, as I was watching that, I'm just like, this is so much fun like you know I think that there's kind of this stigma that's like oh well you know if you have kind of you know you know a a sexy thriller or a sexy slasher like you know you have to kind of pile on the nudity or you have to pile on the gore and I mean this these movies have some of that but it's not done distastefully you know if we're going to you know you, you just mentioned it now but another really good one is Hard to Die where there's a ton of nudity, and I mean a ton. Like, I think that every single act, main actress in this movie is featured in a shower scene. But to show, like, how, like, I guess not sexy it is at all, maybe it is kind of sexy, but, like, when they're, like, soaping up, like, they add this, like, exaggerating, like, squeaking noise. And it's just stuff like that that's, like, I don't they're know. They're rubbing on balloons. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. And, I mean, that's the thing with, you know, Jim Ranowski, where, you know, with his movies, you know, they, they all kind of have this level of, of sex to them, but at the same time, they're very fun and very campy and somewhat self-aware where they're, you know, not a, none of these actresses would say, you know, like, oh, like, I didn't know the kind of movie that I was making because it is exactly the kind of movie that it delivers for its hardcore audience. And, um, I know that we talked about it before on our show, but, I mean, Hard to Die is kind of one of those movies that kind of, it checks all of those boxes where, you know, you have, like, the girls in the isolated location with the nudity, and it's kind of a supernatural slasher, and it's it's sadly the kind of movie that I don't think would ever be made today. They would either kind of, they would either ramp it up to the point where all of a sudden it becomes a parody or they would take the, it way too seriously and it would, be, it would be missing all the fun. Yeah, well, I mean, Hard to Die was one of those where it was a product of its time. I mean, if they, they did it, but they did it earnestly. And if they tried to do it now, you're right, it would be parody. I mean, it does end up extremely silly and laughable, but it's just, it's, it's fun. <laughs> now it would just be mean spirited and 
I don't know. They would yeah, be just I mean, naked for it. naked's sake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about that a little bit on our on our podcast before, but I think that's the biggest big problem with kind of horror movies today is that they try to play it both ways. They either have that kind of winking material that, you know, that winking attitude that's like, oh, hey, like, we know the kind of movie we're making, and, like, we're going to go deliberately over the top, and that really doesn't work. Or they try to be overly earnest to the point where, you know, it's like, oh, come on, like, why can't this just be fun? Yeah. They either, they take it one or the other too far, um, where they need to find, like, the nice balance in the middle. And I think a lot of them are kind of scared to do that, so. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a balancing act, and it's not one that a lot of, you know, movies can really kind of hedge their bets either way, especially, I mean, you know, now we're kind of in the kind of micro-budget filmmaking where, you know, even to get a small budget, you know, it takes a lot of work, you know. It's not like, okay, well, you know, we have this idea, and if you make a girl, and it's like, oh, here's 100 grand. Like, it doesn't really work that way anymore. And I think because they have to try to appeal to as wide of audience as possible, I think that's part of the reason that we're getting so many kind of generic thrillers. Uh, um, so what other movies would you like to talk about? Oh, well... That's a good question. I had, um, oh, oh, of course. Um, well, I mean, this is a two for one deal since much like Sorority House Master 2 and Hard to Die, they're the same movie with different locations. But I'm going to go with Bikini Island and Last Dance. Now, Bikini Island was on HBO all the time in like 1992, 93. I loved it. And it's so it's it's Swimmer Illustrated is doing their big anniversary issue in the Virgin Islands, aka Dusty California. And they take five models to compete to be the cover girl that would get one hundred thousand dollars and they start dying off. Now Last Dance is exactly the same movie, but it's a strip club in LA and they're running Miss D T V contest where the winner gets to be DTV. And she goes on to movies and music videos. And it's just very kind of like, okay, so you're basically a model. But one by one, the girls are killed off in completely ridiculous ways. But it's a great two-for-one. It's a great double feature. Seek them out. They're amazing. You know, I completely agree with you on both of these, you know. They're so, like, and you're right. I mean, they're pretty much the same movie. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they took one script and they're just like, okay, well, let's change the location, let's change the characters' names, we'll change the best, but everything else will be the same. Um, yeah. But that's part of the fun. And, you know, with with these kind of movies, you know, they don't make any sense. You know, it's it's one of those things where, like, especially, like, in last dance where, you know, yeah, they're having this, like, big, you know, like, the the biggest, you know, music channel. I mean, obviously, it's supposed to be MTV, but, like, they're going to have, it like, this sleazy, like, strip club, like, that's, like, darkened, and there's probably room for, like, I, I know when they have, like, the big competition, there's, like, five people in the bar. Like, it's just, it doesn't make any sense at all, and that's part of the reason why it's so enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even with that movie, I mean, there's this kind of like, oh god, like I, I'm not gonna give away who the killer is, but when it's kind of the killer reveal and then how the killer dies and how the killer comes back, it's so funny. It's just, it's oh god, like it, you know, they had to have known exactly the kind of movie they were making because it's so delightfully over the top and it's just it's it's having fun just for the sake of having fun, and there's nothing wrong with that. Well, and like a big shout out to Elaine Hendricks, who is in Last Dance, who actually went on to do like legitimate Hollywood films. I mean, she was in Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion and the Parent Trap remake and Superstar. It's just 
good on her. Because <laughs> usually if you're in those movies, it's kind of the kiss of death, especially in the late 90s. Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, kind of a couple were able to kind of escape from that and kind of do more. But, yeah, I mean, you know, she's great in it. You know, anyone who knows her, like, she's just got the perfect bitch face where, you know, you know that if you're going to see her, there's going to be something up with her. Um, but, yeah, it's just, she she delivers it, and so does the rest of the cast, cast with, this, with both of these films. But just so so much fun. Like, I know that I've been saying that a lot, but, I mean, that's exactly what these movies are. Well, yeah, and, I mean, there's also something to be said about some of these, like, low-budget sleaze fests. Like, if you look at it, like, on IMDb and stuff, the actors and actresses, they, a lot of them are porn stars or, you know, like, penthouse pets because they have no problems just completely drop and trow and so i mean to get decent performances i mean you know oh everyone's like oh sasha gray she's this great actress i'm like i knew movies were porn stars were playing people way before then they did a good job so it's just it's it's silly but it's part of the part of the late 80s early 90s sleeves fest they kind of would go legit for a little while yeah, and I mean, you never know kind of what's going to come out of that. You know, thank God for John John Waters with um, Tracy Lords, where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we have this actress who, I mean, she she's very good in a lot of his films, and she's very fun. And But, I mean, I would have never expected, like, 20 years ago when I watched Serial Mom, that, you know, this, you know, Fabergé, you know, slutty girl would end up, like, delivering one of the best performances in probably the the decade of this last decade of horror and excision, which if you guys haven't watched it, it's so good. And she kind of delivers one of these performances that I would I would have never expected her to do because it, it it's a fine line p- playing a parent in a horror film where you know you can't go too over the top, but at the same time you have to be believable. And it's a great film in general, but her her performance in that film is what makes that film so unique and so just very powerful. Yeah, I I haven't seen it yet. Um, I was planning on it, but the end was spoiled for me, and I just kind of was like, eh, I'll get around to it sooner or later, but I just haven't had a chance yet. (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, that's one of those movies you definitely have to be in the mood for. I mean, you know, if you're going to compare it to one probably movie, I'd probably compare it to May, where it's, you know, kind of this outcast girl who's trying to make friends and no one really likes her. And, but at the same time, there's kind of this undercurrent of dark humor, which, I mean, I love May and I love Excision. Those are not kind of movies that I'm just going to pop in and say, like, oh, I want a movie in the background. Like, no, even though they're funny, they're just so depressing. Yeah. Well, and that's the hard thing is um, a lot of horror movies that come out is kind of, they they take it so seriously and the, it, it just ends up being depressing, which, you know, every now and then I do love those kind of movies. I just have to be in the right mindset for them. I mean, there's a difference between like my love for 80s cheesy slasher flicks and like something that I'll be legitimately horrified by and I have to be in the right frame of mind to be legitimately horrified. Otherwise, I just feel very strange afterwards. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's kind of an interesting point too when it comes to more than any other genre that I can think of horror is all about kind of that first experience of the movie. And if if it's bad or, you know, something's wrong, you may go to appreciate that horror movie later, but you're probably never going to love it. Whereas, you know, comedies can grow on you. You know, you can feel like, okay, well, there's all this stuff that, you know, I didn't find funny the first time. But horror, it kind of has to sink its teeth into you, that first viewing because if it doesn't, it's kind of lost you forever. I know I know there are certain movies that I've kind of either warmed up to over the years or movies that I've really cooled down on where I 
thought that they were better than what they were. They just didn't didn't hold up to repeat viewings. But at the same time, like, you're kind of in it or you're not. And there's not that much of a gray area when it comes to the genre. Mm-mm. Well, I'm I may be uh tapped out on my, my sleazy slashers. I'm sure you have some more. <laughs> okay, well I I definitely have at least one more. Um this is one that I I'm sure that we probably kind of mentioned in passing before. It's it's one of my favorites. Um you kinda of mentioned with Bikini Islands that um it was one of those that played on HBO all the time. This was very much one of those two, I believe it played on USA a bunch, but it's Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death, which is actually getting a Blu-ray release next week, and I'm shocked. Really? I would have never expected that. <laughs> is it um, is it getting like because uh, that's a uh, Fred Olin Ray, right? Um, ooh, I'm not sure on that. Let me check. Um, yeah, because I know there that some of those sleazy like slasher movies and stuff are being released on their own. Kind of, what team is um, releasing that? I don't even know. I just saw it, like it showed up on like my Amazon. That was like, oh, like it was a my nice, like suggested one. <laughs> well, and that's the thing I love about like DVD and Blu-rays now is everything within reason. Like, I mean, if if you can uh, find out who owns the rights in their uh, they sublicense, you can get pretty much anything. That's that's always <laughs> I love that. I mean, I never thought I would ever see like a cleaned up Blu-ray of Curtains or The Mutilator, but I stand. (laughs) Okay, well, this is interesting. Um, It wasn't by the filmmaker that I thought it was, but Campbell Woman and Avocado Jungle of Death, like the year after the writer did this, he did He Wrote Pretty Woman. No. Yeah, and he also wrote Under Siege and, like, a ton of, like, big Hollywood movies. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I mean, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the guy that wrote, like, Jack Frost. And then he all of a sudden became, like, big budget because he did Identity. Like, he was he was being touted as, like, he went from B movies to A movies with one script. And I always find it really kind of funny how that can happen in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. I mean, who would have ever thought that, you know, the writer and director of Slither would go on to make this, you know, half a billion dollar, like, you know, superhero movie? Oh, I know. And make one of the best Marvel movies, too. I mean, let's be honest. I just... <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, you know, I know that Hollywood gets a lot of shit, and and most of it's deserved. I have to, I have to give Hollywood credit, especially for directors, of really thinking outside of the box. Where you know, you had Jurassic World, you know, the writer director of that, you know, made this million dollar indie film before that, and also, I mean, Godzilla, you know. The director of that, you know, made this $25,000 little monster movie. And it's, you know, although, you know, when you get kind of big budget, you know, you're kind of making a movie by committee. Either way, I'm happy that they're at least taking chances. Well, and that's what I love about uh, Marvel as a film company is they are more than willing to take chances on directors. I mean, you've got James Gunn and then... um, uh, the Doctor Strange is being directed by Scott Derrickson, who started with Hellraiser Inferno and then did Sinister. And then, like, I mean, it's just it, this progression is just kind of like most 
you know, $250 million movies would never be like, oh, we're not giving it to a guy that's made a couple of horror movies. Like, but Marvel's just like, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's do this. See how it goes. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's really great to see. Um, I just kind of wanted to do a throwback to Campbell and Rob kind of jungle of death. I didn't get a chance to describe it at all. Um, this should tell you right here. You got Shan Tweed as this professor who goes into this jungle to, meet with this tribe who are stealing all the avocados and the tribe leader is played by Adrian Barbeau and there's this whole debate between these two tribes about which dip to eat their men with, um, whether it's avocado, uh, um, guacamole dip, or I forgot what the other one was. It's just, it's so much fun and it's really interesting with this movie because watching it today there's a lot of issues, especially with feminism, that this movie brings up that I'm like, oh, like that would be like a Tumblr, Tumblr issue right there where it was very much out of the time. It's very fun, you know. With those two actresses, you kind of know what you're getting, and neither one of them takes the material more seriously than what it has to be. So check it out. Um, you actually brought up something that I kind of wanted to touch on real quick before we have to wrap up the show. Um, which was Hellraiser, um, Heather Langenkamp, mm. the new one. How do you, what do you think? Like, I was excited. Like, I was like, oh, Heather Langenkamp's going to be in Hellraiser. And then Doug Bradley, I read his um, little thing on it, and I was like, oh, oh, no. Like, he, he's like, I, I'm not part of it because I was not allowed to read the script because they gave him this giant like gag order that he has to fill all this stuff out and they're they were saying that people were getting a little too uh a little too mouthy at conventions and stuff and he's just like i'm not signing this i don't care like <laughs> so I, I i find that really suspect but i mean i don't know well i want i, 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 I want to no he's got nothing to do with it either it's all Gary Tunnicliffe. Interesting. Yeah, then the IMDb is all messed up because it has him listed as co-writer and co-producer. Mm-mm. No, um, it's... He was working on one, but according to Doug Bradley, he has no involvement on this one. It just seems like... I mean, it seems like it's the same team that did uh, Hellraiser Revelations. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know. I just assumed that he was the writer because I, I went to IMDb to look it up. And, well, then I assumed that all this stuff on there is false because I'm like, oh, that sounds like that could be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this one kind of came out of nowhere. So it sounds like they're just doing a very quick, 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 quick cash in. 